Okay, well this is functionally the same way I would make a knife sheath for a very large knife, in this case which like a 14 inch blade. Uh, it's actually for a wooden sword for a kid instead of for an actual knife, but uh, it could be a guide either way. So I'm working with some heavier leather today. Um, this is 8 to 9 ounce approximately, uh, closer to the 9 ounce side of things. But it's a really nice side of Wicket and Craig tooling leather that I've got. That I'm going to be using for this. I'm going to do some tooling and stamping on it, so it's probably worth it for that. But otherwise, it's kind of, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing, and I have good leather laying around. This piece is going to be on the front and it's going to be hold a um, button stud here. That's actually going to be what catches on the frog and holds the, the sheet in. Um, again, I don't want that to go all the way through because I'm not lining it. I won't have anything on the back in here to keep the button stud from causing trouble. So I'm going to set it in this piece before I sew it on and then I don't have to worry about it scratching up any finish that they have on the sword. Of course, you can see this belt frog is kind of an odd shape. That's why the, the sword sheath is going to sit angled as it hangs from the belt. And so on on my machine. I want this side of it that's going to be laying on the sheath to not have this lump. So I want to skive that on the back to make it lay out nice and smooth and just kind of taper in. To do that, I'll just use my round knife. Now I've had somebody ask a question about this, um, about cutting with my knife on a granite slab. And the reason I do that is because if you're skiving on this surface, sometimes you'll skive across it, but sometimes you'll just dig in and stop. And you leave divots in your cutting board. Um, if you're working on your granite slab, you'll just slide across it. You won't hit some of these uh, places where I've got a punch and hole in it or something that all of a sudden is raised and cut that off. So that's why a lot of uh, saddle makers and a lot of people that have done a lot of skiving will work on either a smooth quartz, granite, marble slab, or even a piece of glass. Um, I've seen people that use uh, panes of window glass to skive on. And then they just, you're working at an angle very similar to what you would sharpen a knife at, so it doesn't damage the edge because the edge doesn't really cut into the uh, stone. But your knife can just slide across it whenever it does come into contact with it. So you don't have a place like this where you, you skive through and you hit, but you don't actually get this end skived off because you're all of a sudden stuck. You can just go ahead and slide right on through. All right, now a little bit of decoration. This is going to be, as I was told, for a wooden pirate sword. So we're gonna do something more piratey, and I'm gonna do cross swords. I was, now for a cross sword pattern, I just, through a sword, kind of sketched one out um, in my notebook, 
And then I used a light box. I traced it onto another piece of paper. I flipped this piece over on the light box and traced the other side so I've got two of them that match. Uh, then I'm just going to use some tracing film to trace those and transfer them onto the leather. Now, I could have just traced this one with the tracing film um, and then flipped it over or flipped the page over and then traced it. But I decided that this is the way I wanted to go because this is my pattern piece so that I could get it laid out how I wanted on the leather uh, between stitch lines and so on and give myself room. Uh, otherwise, I could have wound up with this too wide and then it just wouldn't have worked as well. So I traced it onto the pattern piece with a light box and then I'll trace that and get it onto my leather. All right, now I'm gonna go ahead and wet all this down. Just kind of making some scratch marks to mark where my uh, collar piece there is going to be. So I can sort of see what I'm up to. And I can use that as a guide for how far down I want to put these pieces. And then just as usual with any carving. Just transfer it through with a stylus point. Okay, now it's still a little too wet to stamp, I think, but I'm gonna go ahead and do the cutting on it while it's like this. Obviously, you gotta do your cutting before you're stamping anyway. There we go. Now normally this is jump right into beveling on a lot of things like this, but actually before I do that, I'm going to take and use a modeling tool and I'm going to add in a little bit of depth uh, like along the blades here, the bevel edge of it. We're going to go ahead and do that before I bevel. Um, and the reason for that is, is if you do it after you bevel, you just wind up mashing it down into the area that you've got beveled. If you do it before, you'll actually bevel down deeper and the blade will look like it stands up some from the background. Just to add our depth before we go around with the bevelers. It's the uh, same idea as you would use for pear shading or something like that before beveling. a variation on the order that you would do any tooling in. Like I want to do this sword before I did that one, which was a mistake I was making there and I had to go back and kind of correct, is that you want to do foremost first. You want to do whatever's in front on the pattern before you work your way to the background. And you'll get more depth out of your tooling that way. Let's get into a couple of these corners with a little pointed beveler. And inside these guards I'm going to use a background tool to mash that down. All right, now, there's a couple spots I'm not real happy with. I'm going to go back and touch up a bit with the modeling tools. So we don't have quite the effect of one sword goes behind the other one. I'm going to go ahead and just pull out that bevel a little bit, take out some of the texture. And now, because you can definitely tell this flat area is the same height as the swords, it looks like the swords are just kind of set into the leather, I want them to stand out a little bit more. I'm going to use a matting tool to 
kind of blend out all around that beveling and smooth it into the background. And that's just done by taking kind of the flat edge of this, or almost flat edge, kind of almost straight, um, smooth tool along the lines and you just sort of, I just kind of work my way in. I've seen people drag them out. Um, but I prefer to start out from the line a little bit and kind of work my way into it. And you can sort of tilt the tool side to side to get into some corners. But you're not trying to drive this tool through the leather. You're just tapping on it. All right, and you can even use this tool kind of by hand to smooth it out a little further. Just sort of burnish that leather down a little bit. Get rid of some lumps and bumps. There we go. Round out our handles. Let's add some decorative cuts. Make it look like the handles are wire wrapped. All right, just gonna use a camouflager to put a border around this. I almost forgot about it. Let this dry out too much, but I caught it before it was too dry. It's one thing about using a better piece of leather is it holds the moisture longer and it stays with this nice point to tool for a longer time. And this is actually really just about perfect. It looks totally dry. If you touch it, it still feels a little uh, cooler and damper. Um, but you can see it gives nice, sharp impressions with lots of detail. There we go. That's what I was planning to do. All right, I'm gonna use some uh, light brown water stain on this one. It's kind of like an antique dye, sort of, an antique stain. Uh, it will help highlight carving. It's got a bit of a reddish tone to it compared to other light browns. Um, for anyone not familiar with brown dyes, they tend to be made out of uh, red and green. And so they tend to lean either one way or the other to red or to green uh, colorations. This one goes pretty far to the red side. And comes out a real nice deep color on this um, Wicket and Craig leather. And like a lot of stains, just keep putting it on, wiping it in, and wiping excess off until you get a nice even color. And just for some contrast, let's go for some black oil dye on this piece. And an accent color, sort of. I use black on the edges when I go to finish them too. Throw some resolin on here. That's a acrylic resolin for a finish. And I'm doing the piece that's black last. Just in case my scrap of sheep wool here picks up any black dye. Um, I don't spread it and put smears on my other piece. And I'll go ahead and wash out the resolin uh, before it had a chance to dry in the sheep wool. And I'll carry any of that away. So we'll inflict it on future projects. 
Okay, let's go ahead and put a button stud onto this black piece. Just drop it there in the anvil. This is a, a rivet back style button stud. So I just need this anvil block and a rivet setter to put together. I prefer them over the screw back style. Just set them in there and they are permanent. And we'll take and glue that onto this top piece. We'll go ahead and rough the leather up a little bit. Make sure those edges push down. Since we skived the back of it, it's actually going to kind of roll down into it. If your skiving is fairly even, if not, you're going to have some bumps. All right, now I'm going to go downstairs to the sewing machine and I'm going to stitch this line and this line across here. I'm not going to bother with these because I'll stitch them together when I stitch the whole sheet together. Okay, now for the spacer or welt pieces, you can actually take and cut another piece out that's shaped exactly like your piece and then just, you know, cut out the center of it um, to make the spacer that goes around. Or, if you want something that's a little bit less wasteful of leather, you can just use leather strips cut straight from the edge of the hide. Uh, of course, they're not going to fit exactly around the edge just as they are, but since leather is moldable and shapeable, you can lay that strip out on there and wet it down. Where it needs to be molded. And then just shape it the way you need it to be. And then all of a sudden a straight strip, no longer straight. It won't work if you've got a really tight bend. You may have to do it in multiple pieces. Um, like if it comes down and out to a point, you may do one piece and then another piece that goes down and meets it. But for this nice gentle curve that I've got on this one, this technique's going to work just fine. Alright, I'm going to let that sit and let that glue set up just a bit before I go and stitch it. Alright, all sorts of madness happened with the stitching. Have some skip stitches and some problems, but managed to finish it up. Man, and then I sanded all the edges to match. And now I'm just gonna go around and take the edge beveler all the way around, front and back, just to take that corner off. So I can round it out a little bit. And then finish it up. Not happy with the stitching. But for a wooden sword for a kid, it's probably extremely awesome just to have a leather sheath like this. So, I'm not going to concern myself too much with it. At the same time, I'm going to go around I'm going to finish up all the edges on this. Bevel them, dye the edges, gum tragacanth, and some slicking. And this should all go together and be done. And in this case, I'm going to actually use a black dye around the edge. So you got to be kind of careful not to get it where you don't want it. hole in the middle of this. Uh -huh. 
see the wood chisel. To cut a slot beside it. And that's where our button stud's gonna pop into. And let's see if it fits, which I'm not sure it will, but it should be close. Stretching and shaping, and yeah, it should be good to go. All right. Well, there's a sword sheath for a little mini pirate. 